Okay, I think we can start now if people, people can always come in as we talk. Um, so again, this will be recorded and everyone who is not in agreement with that has to, to switch off the camera right now. For all of you, um, welcome. Thank you for joining us today in this um, AHA session about our excellent brand new book series, Migrations in History. My name is Rabia and I'm the acquisitions editor in the history department of De Gruyter and focusing on 19th and 20th century global history, both uh, social and cultural history. And for those of you who don't know um, us as a publisher yet, uh, I will give a very, very short overview of what we do and who we are before we move our focus where it belongs on the editors and on the series. Um, so um, we, De Gruyter is um, a family owned scholarly publisher and has been for over 270 years now. And um, the main focus has always been on the humanities. So we have um, basically all the humanities departments uh, in our house, uh, philosophy, history, religion, literary studies, cultural studies, it all comes together, which makes us a very strong interdisciplinary, to, uh, interdisciplinary humanities researcher. And we've been from the, from the start publishing academic books, journals, databases, and now also, of course, no digital formats, um, always of scholarly content. Starting a series on migration in the history department was long, long overdue. So when it finally happened, and also in the doomed year of 2020, we were extremely happy. Happy also because we found an extraordinary group of women to edit the series. And you'll soon find out more about them. Um, since they are the most important thing, not only of today's session, but also of the series, of course, uh, I'll um, happily hand over to them now to, in, to let them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit of where they are coming from. So, um, Anna, would you like to go first and start? Sure, thank you. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. We are delighted that you decided to join this session. Thank you very much for uh, your interest. Um, we have nothing to do if you are not interested in publishing with us. So thank you for being here. I'm Anna Mazurkiewicz. I am based at the University of Gdańsk in Poland. I'm a historian. I do Cold War, migration, exile, US uh, anti-communism using the political exiles from the countries of East Central Europe. I have been working with the Greuter on an edited volume, uh, a first survey on the field, really, when it comes to Cold War migrations. Uh, Elisa Vince and then Gabea were my guides throughout the process. And uh, this is one of the few edited volumes that I did with the scholars from different regions who spoke languages. I could not even pronounce properly their last names. I work in the archives I would never have access to. Um, different historical periods, different uh, backgrounds, different expertise, different reflection, and I'm all taken by the idea of having migrations in history developed. I'm really grateful to the Greuter for uh, supporting this idea. I'm delighted to be in the company of excellent scholars, um, and I'm going to stop right here. So next, um, Catherine, do you want to go next? Because you're next in my little window section. <laughs> okay, so yes, good night, good morning, good evening. My name is Catherine Brice, Catherine Brice, if you'd rather. Um, I'm uh, based at uh, the University of Paris Est Créteil in France. I'm French and I work on Italy. Italy in the 19th century is my, let's say, main specialization. And for the last 10 years, I've been interested in the history of political exile, but rather under an economic aspect and specifically the problems of confiscations of the estate's property. So I'm really excited to be part of this adventure. And it's um, for me it's something pretty new being in, on the board for um, a theory like Migrations and History. And I thank Anna for, uh, let's say, I mean, offering 
me this opportunity and Rabea and the greeter for accepting me around. And I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Marcel? Hello, everybody. My name is um, Machtel Fenke, and I'm a professor in transnational contemporary history at the University of Luxembourg. And the University of Luxembourg is a millennium university. It's a young university, and it's specifically specializing on topics like migration, border studies, multilingualism, intersectionality, digital history. A lot of interdisciplinary work is conducted at this university as well. Um, I wrote a book on uh, Polish and Soviet migrants to Belgium, uh, but now in Luxembourg, I'm basically looking also at France, Luxembourg, uh, Germany, the Netherlands. Um, so these are all regions that uh, I, I, well, I would also like to see um, being presented in, in, in the series. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and so uh, since the fourth series editor is um, not here yet, I can't see her anywhere uh, in the audience as well. Um, does someone from you want to take over introducing her? Because otherwise I just read out what I have. Okay. Madalena uh, Marinari is our uh, good colleague. Uh, our paths crossed in the United States at the Immigration History Research Center. We are, um, I'm going to talk about me and Madalena for a second. We are disciples of uh, Donna Gabaccia, <laughs> who bred the whole uh, generation, I guess, of scholars of, of migration. Madalena Marinari is at the Gustavus Adolphus uh, College. Um, in the Department of History. So again, the focus of this series is on history. We are historians, but this does not mean that the series is restricted to uh, historians. Madalena has published a book, uh, widely acclaimed already, Unwanted, Italian and Jewish Mobilization Against Restrictive Immigration Laws, 1882-1965, University of North Carolina Press, and from the University of Illinois Press, A Nation of Immigrants Reconsidered U.S. Society in an Age of uh, Restriction, 24 to 65, 20th century, of course. I think she will be joining us shortly, and, and hopefully you will get to know her as well. Uh, wonderful to have her on our team. Yes, thank you so much, Anna. So um, I believe the most interesting thing and the reason for, for everyone being here today um, is to, to learn more about um, the series. So what, what is the series about? And would you like to tell us a little bit more about this, please? The idea, thank you, thank you, Albert. The idea of the series was born out of um, our concern uh, that given so much interest um, and focus on migration, which is the defining problem of our times as we wrote in our um, invitation paper, uh, there's very little historical reflection uh, about it. You know, so much has uh, already been tried. You know, uh, human experience with migration is as old as humanity and itself across time, across regions, across the planet and uh, across disciplines as well. So the series focuses on migrations in historical context. Oh, here's Madalena. Hi, welcome. We are just beginning. So this is our uh, for uh, editor. Uh, welcome, Madalena. Would you like to say hello to everyone? I want to stop for a moment. Yes, thank you so much. I'm sorry, but the time change really messed up with my arrival. So my name is Madalena Marinari, and I teach uh, U.S. History at Gustavus Adolphus College. So we were interested in uh, studying the processes of migration in comparative perspective, um, in uh, global perspective, really comparing uh, human experience and uh, migration across um, time and space. But also we wanted the series to be uh, in English so that we could actually engage in a more fruitful dialogue. Um, a lot of wonderful research has been prepared in French, in German, in Polish, in Romanian, in Hungarian. And, uh, you know, there's very little exchange if we don't use our lingua franca, which in contemporary sciences, in humanities as well, seems to have been overtaken by the English language. So the series is really um, a way to engage in a dialogue to provide more context and more, I don't know if I'm freezing or not, 
um, and more uh, fuel really for debates that would help us understand what we are dealing with nowadays. Nowadays that human mobility, I want to say, is unprecedented when the refugee numbers that the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees is collecting are skyrocketing. It's already surpassed the dark decade of, of uh, late 1930s, 1940s. And so what? Uh, in order to understand it, in order to uh, be able to contribute really to the contemporary debates, finding a solutions, we want to study the countries of origin, the countries of transit, the countries of um, arrival, integration. Um, we want to look at the memory of uh, migration. We want to critically analyze and talk to one another across the borders, across our disciplines and across the linguistic barriers. And the Gruder gave us a framework for that. So this is what the series is basically about. We want to focus on migration historical context from antiquity to present. But if you are not a historian and you want to submit your work with us, please do it, but frame your work historically so that we would understand what are the origins, the roots, the sources of the phenomena that you are describing. We want to emphasize with our series the shared global experience of migration, but also interconnections. Um, we want to look again at the entire process. Um, so not just diasporic presence, but you know the origins of migration, the transit and the memory, as I said. And again, the most, the ultimate goal for the series is fostering a global conversation on the history of migration. So um, if you want to publish with us, um, we are uh, more than happy to uh, look at your work. Uh, we want monographs, we want edited volumes, we also want uh, to um, consider translations of outstanding works uh, that would contribute to the discussion, to the dialogue, to the conversation that I mentioned. And um, we also hope that the series will be received not only by historians, uh, but also sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, scholars who study migration um, and want to get this root information, the background to better understand what we are dealing with right now. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and just um, as a heads up, uh, in the end, um, there will be time for questions. So if anyone has questions um, about this, um, a little patience, please. Uh, there will be time at the end. So um, since um, scholars thrive with networks, um, I'd uh, ask Machtel now to um, tell us a little bit about our advisory board. I think Madalena was going to do this. Madalena? I'm happy to do it. Okay, Welcome thanks. everyone and again apologies for my uh, delay. So I'm going to try to share the link so that you can actually see um, the broad range of members uh, of our advisory board. And we really wanted it to do two things, um, cover, try to cover as many periods and eras within migration studies, but also at least start with uh, an international migration um, uh, advisory board. Right now, it mostly includes scholars from uh, Europe and the United States, but our hope is to continue to work with to continue looking for members who are actually outside of uh, this parts of uh, the world. We also intentionally approached not just giants in their field, but also people who have connections, perhaps in other parts of the world. Because um, while we read a lot, right, we can't possibly know everyone. So uh, this is a starting point, uh, but we were also careful in choosing, we were very careful in choosing people who had connections to scholars in Africa or Australia, Asia. And so our hope is that as our series gets more established, uh, we will be able to add the advisory board. So if you have suggestions, by all means, uh, approach one of us, uh, send, send us an email. But um, we also wanted to send uh, another message with the members of our board. So we didn't want to just cover geographical areas or, uh, or time periods, but also a broad range of themes. Um, if you take nothing away from this session today is that we are open to any lens through which you can study migration. 
as long as it's historically grounded, we're extremely flexible. We really want to showcase with this series in how many different ways we can think about mobility. And I think our advisory board really will help us accomplish that. Thank you. Now it's Martel <laughs> talking us through um, manuscript submission. That's important. Manuscript submission. So if you think, uh, if you're interested in, in publishing with us, then uh, contact the Greuter, contact uh, Rabea or another editor of the Greuter and they will uh, come to the, um, Rabea and she's our contact point. So we will receive your book um, proposal. And then uh, it's up to us. So it's with the four of us. We see whether we have the feeling we have the competences in-house in order to um, uh, evaluate that book proposal or not. If not, we reach out to our advisory board already at the stage of the book proposal. And we come back to you and we, see, uh, we say whether we um, invite you to submit the full um, manuscript or not. Um, and we talk with you about the schedule so that we can also see how it could fit uh, within the series. Most importantly, we're looking for um, original unpublished research or a translation of a very successful high quality book that is already out there. So um, not a compilation of already published uh, research articles. That's not what we are interested in. Um, as the most important criteria is that um, it, it, it it leans, but it, it adheres to the principles of the series as they are uh, defined on the website and uh, in the series description and as they were already presented by, by Anna Mazurkiewicz, my co-editor in this series. Um, um, we are especially looking forward to a comparative work, to work that um, um, has the ambition to uh, speak about phenomena that can be seen um, across time and in various regions. So really to, in order to um, put this series out there as, as something that is of value on a global scale and uh, a one single case study um, in this respect, um, it can be valid, but uh, only if it's really very well contextualized in, 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 in a broader international transnational um, framework so that it's not only translating or public writing your book in English, but it's really, really um, speaking to an international audience and making sure that these research findings can, can, can be applied, can be, can be used in an international dialogue about uh, migration history. Oh yeah, the, 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 P, the double peer review process, I'm very, very sorry. So the, one, the moment we receive your manuscript, either uh, it, it could be a monograph or it could be an uh, edited volume, it goes through a double bind peer review process. So, um, and normally there are two reviewers who look at your work and then you will receive the full reports and we guide you through the process um, of that double peer review process. Uh, in order to make changes twice. And only afterwards, uh, your book uh, can be published. And it's also with translations. Uh, we, we need to see the full English translation and the full English translation needs to go through the peer review process. It's not that it first goes in an original language and then can be published. We want to see the quality of the English and the way it speaks to an English um, speaking audience. Thank you. So now we learned a lot about what the series is about, um, the, the more technical, more theoretical um, issues involved. Um, and Catherine, I would now um, love to hear um, more about the first publication and um, publications that are already accepted. So if you could start um, and tell us a little bit about that, that would be great. Okay, thank you, Abia. Yeah, so it's my pleasure to introduce now what will be the very first volume of our series, but obviously not the last, and well, which is a good news, since we already have in review uh, two books, I mean two books, one which is a uh, monography on the migration and the construction of German identities after the Second World War. Another one, which is a collective volume, a handbook dedicated to Hungarian refugees after the revolution. 
but we are also looking for other types of publications, I mean, linked to conferences, for instance. So we are seeking for conferences on themes that are we're interested in. We are trying to approach, I mean, specialists of Roman history, of early modern history. But for this very first step, this very first volume, we have been extremely bold, starting with a book dealing with 19th, 19th, not 20th, we were not 21st, but 19th century uh, exile. So it was also a pleasure to personally bring this proposal to De Gruyter, since I have been part, I mean, not, I mean, in full, but I mean, I've been a little part in the making of the book. This book uh, is called Banished, Traveling the Roads of Exile in 19th Century Europe. And it's a volume edited by Delphine Diaz and Sylvie April, who are with us today. So Sylvie April, I must say they're both friends, so my introduction will be nice, but I think they deserve it. So Sylvie April is a professor in contemporary history at the University of Paris, of Paris Nanterre, sorry, Paris West Nanterre. And amongst many other books and articles, she is the author of a book called Le Siècle des Exilés, uh, going a period going from the French Revolution to the French Commune in 1870. And it's a book that has been published in 2010 by CNRS Edition. It is an important book because in a way, one could say that Sylvie in France has relaunched the interest for writing a political history of exile, but a political history of exile, including also, I would say intellectual, social history, and adding a specific interest that she has then developed maybe more in depth uh, in articles to come for material life in exile, which is how do you really live in exile, but also the history of emotions or a gendered history of exile. Delphine Diaz uh, is currently assistant professor at Reims, at University de Reims, you know where the champagne comes from, so it's a pretty good place to be. She's a junior member of the Institut Universitaire de France, which is a, an extremely renowned uh, organization, I would say. And she has published in 2014 a book that has been very much commented, which is called An Asile pour tous les peuples, an asylum for all the people, all the nations, exiled and refugees in France during the first half of the 19th century. While Sylvie was interested in French exiles in the 19th century going abroad, Delphine was interested, focused uh, with the foreign exiles gathering in France. And she focused on a very important moment, the first half of the 19th century, the moments that saw so many European revolutions from Italy, Greece, Spain, the Habsburg Empire, the uh, Confederate German uh, states, Italy again, and so on. But it's also a very crucial moment for the construction, the legal construction of the figure of the exile through, uh, I mean, a number of legislative operations. But in her book, she is, of course, also very much interested in the social and political lives of these communities abroad on the French territory. So they are both complementary. And before giving the floor to Delphine and Sylvie, as one says, I would just say that I think one of the common denominator of their work is that exile, as historians for them, are not statistics are not figures. I mean, they are exiles in flesh and bones. They're not only ideas flying or fleeing over the countries. There are people writing about books, you know. So this is, I think, a characterization of the history of exile in France. It, of course, considers 
the numbers, considers the ideas, but is also very interested in working on the exiles as people. And people, the same people we see today in the migrations of the 21st century. So after this short presentation, I don't want to take any more time because I think that Delphine and Sylvie have, I mean, organized a more exhaustive presentation of the book. So let's say I'm proud of having been part in the adventure of this book, this specific book. And I'm proud of having presented, I mean, submitted this very first manuscript. And now I would like to leave the co-editors of Banish, Delphine and Sylvie, uh, presenting it much more in uh, detail. So, so the floor is yours and the PowerPoint too. Thank you, Catherine. So hello everyone. We'll share my presentation. I hope it is fine for everyone. So I'm very, very pleased to, to participate today in this presentation of the, the new series of the greater on the history of migration. It's a great honor for Sylvia April and for me to contribute to this series with the, the new book we co-edited on the history of exile in Europe during the 19th century. First, we would like to express our gratitude to the directors of this new collection for the trust they have placed in us with a spe special thought for Catherine, who took part in the book and who supported it. Let me present in a few words the very origins of the project that gave rise to the writing of this first book of the series, which is entitled Banished, Traveling the World of Exile in 19th Century Europe. We directed this book with Sylvie with the participation of a whole team of 12 European researchers, Asile Europe, were reflected for four years on what Sylvie April called the century of exile. That is to say that long 19th century marked by revolution, repression, and proscription. This program, which, which was carried out by my university in France, also gave rise to international conferences, such as two years ago on family and gender in exile during the 19th century as well as the launch of a website. And the latter offers a whole range of resources, lexicographical, cartographical, iconographic, on the reality and representations of exile in 19th century Europe. So this collective and very fruitful experience gave us the desire to come together and propose another view book on the topic of exile in 19th century Europe. Since we all had all noticed a gap in the bibliography on this topic. Admittedly, there were already important and recent books on the history of political exiles. Whether it was a question of studying the immigration of the outcasts, as Sylvie did uh, in her book, or whether it was a question of focusing on the reception of foreign refugees in a given country. That is what, for instance, Carolyn Shaw, uh, an American historian, did recently in her book, Britannia's Embrace, about the British tradition of welcoming foreigners. Nevertheless, the, the project of this new book, written by several hands, was rather different. From a strictly scientific po point of view, it tends to propose a synthesis of what has been written over the last 20 years on the topic of 19th century exile, especially with the rise of transnational history, colonial history, and gender history. We also want to bring a fresh look based on unexplored European records, whether from administrative, diplomatic, cultural sources, in order to show that since the 19th century, the reception of refugees has been a major problem for European nation states. But the starting point of this book is not only purely scientific, it's also a response to a crisis of the present time. It wants 
to help to rethink the so-called migration crisis of 2015 in Europe that by placing it in a long time frame. This renewed political and media interest in migration and exile and in the category of refugee has led many researchers to place this phenomena in a longer perspective. And that's what we are trying to do here, first to detach them from the present day uh, and from the short-sighted viewpoint. So moving backward to two centuries, the starting date for this study and for this new book is the year 1815, immediately after the Congress of Vienna. Without seeking to compare the past and the present term by term, these books want to shed light on other migrant crises or asylum crises associated with exiles and refugees that affected Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. Even if the sources that we rely on are mainly European, the book strives to show that this history of exile and asylum in 19th century Europe was never a pure and exclusively European phenomenon. The exile circulating on the continent could come from far more distant horizons, the Americas, for instance, the Ottoman Empire, but European exiles themselves were continually pushing back the frontier of where they sought refuge. They did not hesitate to settle in Anatolia, in North African colonies, or on the other side of the Atlantic or in Oceania, as was the case for many British Chartists deported to Australia, who remained in exile after serving their, their, their sentence. So our focus in the book falls on some European countries more than others, due to the way in which this book has been written as part of a research program by others wishing to compare several given spaces, France, Great Britain, Belgium, Switzerland, that is to say the main asylum countries during the 19th century, but also other countries less expected from this point of view, as for instance, the German states, Spain and Italy. The books set out to study the departure, travels, reception of these exiles in 19th century Europe, from the Congress of Vienna to the uh, 1870s, uh, 1880s. It was only after the end of the Napoleonic War that exile became a political institution, a pol political institution, sorry, almost a, a rite of passage for opponents, revolutionaries, patriots yearning for nation states. So in order to, to grasp the diversity of the exile situations and stances, we have opted for a methodology and a way of writing that enables us to track these protagonists as closely as possible. Admittedly, it is essential to make a political history of states, of their legislative apparatus, of their diplomacy towards refugees with a top-down approach. But the history of the state and reception provisions in place are for us inseparable from that of civil society in Europe. For instance, it means that when we consider the policy of assistance to refugees, it is also necessary to analyze the practices of civil society, which also supported refugees, like for instance, the Polish refugees in the uh, 1830s, with many, many, many committees, national and transnational committees that raise money for them. In tracing their itineraries throughout their migration, we have also compared uh, administrative archives of the lands of departure, transit, and research, as well as sources left by the exiles themselves. It allows the banished of those ancient times to speak in their own words, reproducing their texts, their speeches, in, including also uh, the, the literary works and photographic works uh, during the, their exile. By giving back the world to the banished themselves, we also want to restore the complexity of the experience of exile. Not only a moment of disgrace and an experience of suffering, 
but also a migration that could give political opponents another scope from abroad and that allowed them to make surprising professional reconversions in exile. From this perspective, we have chosen an organization both chronologically and thematically oriented to cover the 19th century of the, the banished. The first chapter is a reflection on the key moments of exile that brings out the complexity of the reasons pushing Europeans to leave their homeland in, in that time period. But we also want to better understand the answers of the European states to the continuous flow of exiles. We examine the national provisions for receiving exiles and refugees, bearing in mind that the countries of asylum also selected and expelled many refugees. So how did the European nation states influence each other in the adoption of the new policies and of new tools of repression? From the outset, we articulate this reflection on nation states with the point of view of the exiles themselves. We tackle the time and condition of departure, the experience of crossing borders illegally, but also the circulation and settlement of foreign refugees in given European countries. So how did they continue their professional and family life, both of which could be interrupted by forced migration? Yet expatriation did not simply mean a rupture, for it could also generate new ways of reinventing one's life and pursuing political commitments from abroad. The book offers some striking portraits, such as that of the French Republican Victor Front, a lieutenant in Paris. In exile after the coup of Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, he discovered a new trade as a photographer and he became the first to produce a photo reportage about Brazil. So far, I've, talk, uh, I've talked a lot about the male exiles and refugees, but I would like to highlight that in the book, we consider the exiles involved in these travels in all their diversity, with much room devoted to women and children, many of whom were also forced to move so they have long been eclipsed in the gender specific historiography of those migrations of the 19th century. Finally, the book closes on the topic of exiles, impossible or difficult return to their home countries, together with examination of how the memory of exile was subsequently constructed. On certain occasions, exile was viewed as a foundational experience as in Italy, where a great number of exiles became members of the first Italian parliament, for instance. So <laughs> I will stop now because I think that my time is over, but if Sylvie wants to add something or Catherine. Peut-être <laughs> Sylvie, I mean. Yes, uh, no, I totally agree <laughs> with, with uh, what uh, Delphine uh, said. I would just uh, uh, want to say that uh, we, we want to really to underline the link between uh, past and, and present and also the legacies uh, of, uh, of, of exile uh, in, uh, in Europe. And uh, we really tried uh, to, to make uh, um, a global Euro European and also a national uh, uh, history yeah. and all we try to to to, to, to find a uh, very very di di different and uh, uh, experiences uh, about this uh, this exile in, uh, in the 19th century and uh, um, we emphasize uh, I think we really uh, and we discover uh, the, the 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 main place of uh, women and also the family in in exile that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> There's nothing to add, really. I mean, what I think is really fascinating is the book is the number of characters that come up, that pop up. I mean, Victor Fron is one example, but it's not about the big figures of exile, Mazzini, Victor Hugo. It's really about 
let's say normal people. And I think one of the great praise, praise of the book is having, being able to track these not very important exiles through archives, through records, through their memories, uh, in a very coherent and on a rather long term, and be able to, I mean, unveil the complexity, as Delphine said, of uh, this different path in exile, which is, as she said, path of, uh, of course, pain, suffering, but also reinvention, uh, discovery of new opportunities, which were also at the core of their departure, because they departed because they were contesting the spaces, the states they were living in, and finding out ex in exile, though being abroad from home and in difficult conditions, the opportunities to rebuild themselves. And you have lots of examples of that kind in the book, which makes, amongst other things, I think it's, uh, it's richness and also its potentiality to be developed and in a certain way imitated for other areas, other moments. So that's all I wanted to add to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, Elephine, uh, Sylvie, and uh, Catherine. Um, I think this was an excellent glimpse into what will be an, a brilliant first publication for the series. And uh, it's time now to, to open um, the floor to, to our audience if they have questions. So uh, any question about the series, um, how to submit um, the book, if you like, um, feel free to, to ask now. I think you have to unmute yourself first, but then you're good to go. And you can also post questions into the chat if you prefer that, of course. No question at all. I can't see any raised hands. So I want uh, to. I just wanted to say that I would like to acknowledge the presence in the audience. I just had a look at the list of attendees of the members of our advisory board. We are delighted that you guys uh, decided to join us. We need your support. We are delighted by your presence. Thank you. And also, if you want to help us, if you think you have uh, the network and the interest and you sympathize with what we want to do and you would like to join us, please let us know. We need to be plugged into the networks. We need your support. We need your expertise. So um, I think now we have the questions. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to read them out because they were posted in the chat. The first question is, um, is this series interested in only modern periods? Definitely no. I think we're as historians, very interested is in any period from antiquity to now, but I mean, Middle Ages, uh, early modern, I mean, you know, 15th, 16th century are extremely interesting moments for the history of migration, the history of exile, the history of refugees. And what has been described for the 19th century is something that can absolutely be studied for other centuries. Of course, uh, it's different, but the, the frame of analysis can be completely uh, applied. And so, no, no, absolutely not. We're interested in everything, even prehistorical migration. Yeah. I think this fits with the, the last question here. Could it be to submit a book proposal about ancient and medieval periods? And you just answer that. Yes, um, please. As well, right? Uh, and then there is a question about the um, submissions, um, have the process for submitting book proposals. We do have a specific book proposal form. You can uh, find it um, on our website. Um, and you can always also write me an email and I'll get back to you and send you the form. But there's a book proposal form on our website.
I don't, and okay, okay. What would be the distribution in the US and what are your prices? Well, that depends on the book, right? A book of 150 pages um, won't cost as much uh, as a book that has 500 pages. Um, so we can't say, um, but it, yeah, it, 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 it's all um, hardcover first, paperback options later, and the paperback will always be one third of the original hardcover price, which makes it um, affordable, uh, and especially for the US market, of course, and for, for conferences. Um, and the distribution in the US uh, works usually if there's not, not a pandemic or riots or something like that happening, um, just like it does here. We have um, um, an office in Boston. We have uh, our distribution team and our sales team in the US. Um, so there's no, there's no difference. Um, we have a question about how long does it take from acceptance to print? Um, and I think it, it depends what you mean by acceptance. If, if you mean the acceptance by the series editors, um, then it depends on the review, because even if the series editor says, say, this is something for a series, it has to go through peer review then first. Um, and that's always a big unknown. Um, but if we're talking about the submission of the manuscript after peer review, so when every edit is done until you have it in your hands, then it's roughly six to seven months. Can I add something? Sure. I think one of the reasons why this series is more is so exciting is because of the scope of the Reuters market, right? I mean, if you publish with us, your book will end up across the world, which is amazing, I think. I, I also really appreciate how quickly the press is willing to work with you once you've revised your manuscript, right? So this is beyond once you submit it to us, done the, received the pre-reviews and revised it. So once it's revised, it's actually phenomenally fast compared to other uh, so a lot depends on how fast our peer reviewers are, but also on how quickly our authors can work on their revisions. But once the manuscript gets is completed in the hands of uh, the press, the turnaround is impressive, honestly. I also wanted to mention something, considering that it looks like we have um, a very international audience. One of the amazing things about this group of series editors is that we cover a lot of different languages. So if you want to approach us in your own language first, you can do that too, right? I mean, I think it's impressive. It's not very common that you have people who speak French, German, English, Italian, right? Polish. So um, if breaking the ice is difficult, please approach the one uh, that you feel most comfortable with in terms of your first language, even though the book has to be in English. Definitely. Um, there's a question about um, how long the series is going to be continued. Um, she says, I'm, I'm preparing a thesis concerning Polish refugees in Spain during the Second World War, um, which would suit um, the object objectives, but it will take me around three to four years to finish it. So there's, there's, we don't want the series to ever end. Exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, you have to finish your thesis and then rewrite it and pass it to us. But I, I really hope we'll still be there. Yeah, it will be because, yeah. yeah. There's Fabio de la Schiava with asking, I'm surprised to see the two volume which have been presented are so good as ready, but they are announced for, two, for 2022. Uh, they still have to be reviewed. So it will depend on Sylvie and Delphine to integrate the corrections, and then it will be seven months from the moment that the manuscript is completely ready to go. It might be end of 2021, I guess. It could be, yeah. And I it's easily done to, to change the publication date, of course. And I would have a, a question. I should know the answer. Are there digital uh, versions of the book? 
there's always an ebook published with a um, printed version uh, simultaneously. Yes, there's always an ebook, and we have the uh, there's the possibility to upload um, additional digital material, supplementary material on our website for free. That's possible as well, and we do not only publish the ebook as PDF but also as EPUB, so it's easy to embed whatever you like. Okay, thanks. Thanks. When it comes to prices, it's usually uh, in the range of 80, 90 euro, which is uh, to be expected for the hardcover. But just like like Labra was saying, you know, then you have the, uh, you know, for my book, it took eight months for the edited volume uh, to be uh, released in the beautiful uh, form of a paperback. It looks, you know, impressive. Uh, but, and I also wanted to, um, give the kudos to the greater for being very efficient in sending the book once it's out to reviewers. So your book is not just going to be landing on the shelves of uh, very rich libraries, it's going to get out there in the paper book form, in the ebook form. And also uh, they do send the books to the reviewers that you might help them select. I select, sometimes uh, you have no say in where the book is ending for it to be reviewed. Thank you. Um, another question, um, is it possible to publish not only broader synthesis, but also biographies of particular stories of migrants? I'm happy to answer that question. So yes, of course, a case study can be very, very interesting, but you're um, addressing an English speaking audience, an international audience. So you have to make sure that you explain why this case study adheres to uh, migration studies at large, so internationally not a, uh, uh, a case study that is um, uh, interesting or valid for one, uh, for one country that has been written in one specific language that then just is translated into English and then published right away. There is a, a process you need to go through in order to make sure that the people who are actually going to read the book understand the book and, and, and can use it for their purposes. But if in doubt, just send me an email. We can always talk about everything uh, and see if it fits, but it, it, it doesn't hurt to talk. It never does. And yes, we do have native English speaking editing services. Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to mention that this is another advantage of approaching us earlier rather than later, right? Uh, we cover a lot of ground among the four of us. So we know the historiography well and we can help you with that transition, right? Uh, and so if you, are, if you have a project that you think you might fit, just get in touch with us. Uh, it's our job also to help you succeed, right? Because um, we, we read the manuscripts too, and we want to make sure that they speak to a broad audience, uh, even when perhaps they're narrow or laser focused on a specific individuals. These all sound like amazing projects, so please don't disappear. <laughs> no, no. Okay, so, so there are no more questions. Oh, just now. Yes, um, I will post my email address right now. All send me your emails. Go. Ah, how Which to strategy? write that the digital copies will be immediately available in pirate website? This is a good question. They're probably even, it's impossible. Well, you cannot just download them. If they are not published in open access, um, they are behind a paywall. But if we're being hacked, we're being hacked. So we're not, I, I, yeah. Then we can, we can do nothing about it. But usually, um, just because it's digital doesn't mean it's for free, only if it's an open access. And then it's a whole different story, of course. But copyright should be protected either way, because there are um, DOIs, DOIs, um, used in the, in the digital versions. Um, so we're, we're trying to protect copyright as much as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And so you now get all our email addresses. So no excuses. Yes. Messages in 
Polish or not? Do you want to translate or? Okay. Anna, you're, you're muted. Okay, okay. I'm looking for the question um, uh, because there is also a private communication channel. It's really funny to be you know, multitasking here. I cannot see the question asked in Polish, but I strongly recommend that anyone, I just posted my email address here. Um, serdecznie zapraszam do tego, żeby do mnie napisać, okay? So whoever would like to contact me, I'm more than willing to address all the questions you might want to have. Uh, email me, call me. Um, I'll be delighted and I'm also delighted by noticing names of the people whose work I know, respect, and I'm really fond of, and I look forward to uh, as your final, uh, the results of, 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 of the final results of your research. So please do contact me. I'll try to find the question. If I do, I'll respond. No, no, I, I think, think it was you. just thank you. Yes, <laughs> just brilliant. So perfect, because we are right on time. Um, no more questions, thank you. To all of you joining us, to the series editors, to the book editors, um, very much looking forward to continuing working together and to to work with with everyone I haven't worked with just yet. Um, yeah, this will be an amazing year, and looking forward to to celebrate the first publication that comes with this series. Champagne from Reims. Yes, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.